All right, let's get started. How is everybody doing? Great. <laughs> Great, me too. Uh, my wife told me this morning she thought I looked like Steve Jobs. She wore a black shirt. And I was like, girl, Steve Jobs does not pull this off. Uh, um, no, but then on the way out, I was like, oh, and one more thing. I love, I love you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was cheesy then too. Um, anyway, and then Amy told me she thought I looked like Steve Jobs too, so I'm like, okay, I gotta buy a new shirt. Um, it's Wednesday, it's week two, we are studying collections. Last time we talked about vectors, and I talked to you about this big O notation. Uh, what's a big O notation used for again? What does it represent? Efficiency. Efficiency, was that what you were going to say? Yeah. <laughs> one, one guy was nice enough to raise his hand, and then everyone else shouted it out. Both of those are acceptable forms of communication. Um, <laughs> It's used for efficiency. Uh, it, there's a specific, you could be a little more specific than that though, right? Like if I say big O of N versus big O of N squared, like kind of what am I really trying to say by that? What does that phrase mean exactly? Yes? Uh, how it's How the runtime of the algorithm scales when the input that we're feeding it grows. That's the important thing is growth rate. That's what a big O uh, class really means. Yes, uh, good comment. Yeah. Time complexity is good enough term for that? What, you can say time complexity or time efficiency, runtime efficiency. These are all terms that people use somewhat interchangeably. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're going to talk more about that today and Friday. Uh, I'm also going to teach you some other collections that we can use. Uh, your sections begin this week. Do you guys get email telling you what section that you're in? Yes, if you don't know what section you're in, Go to your, uh, your phone or your computer sometime today and go to the cs198.stanford.edu website. If you log in here, it should tell you what section that you're in. You might want to check it during or after class because some of the sections are today after lecture. So you don't want to miss your first section. If you forgot to sign up, you can go to the same website to do a late sign up and we can get you placed into a section this week. Okay? So don't forget about sections. We're starting those. Uh, I don't want to talk a lot about section because we have limited time, but sections, we post the handouts a day or two ahead if you want to look at the problems we're going to be talking about. The problems are also in our little online tool, Code Step by Step. You don't have to solve these ahead of section. You go into section and you talk about these problems together and work on some of them. If you don't finish all of them, that's okay. There's like 10 problems in there. You're not going to finish all of them. Uh, the ones that you don't finish are not homework. Those are just there if you want to look at them later, and you should get a solution key at the end if you want to look at the answers. So these are just problems you look at while you're in your section, and then beyond that, it's up to you. It's optional. Okay, so I want to go back to what we said about, uh, about big O and growth rates. So we talked about how if you have a complicated expression representing the runtime of an algorithm, really all that matters is the most significant term, and we throw away constants in front of that. We just say n cubed is the order of this algorithm. And of course, the higher that that power is, the more, the slower your program is or your, your, uh, your growth rate is faster for a given input growth. Um, so we talked about these vector operations, how some of them are a constant amount of time and some of them are a linear amount of time where they're proportional to the size of the vector n. Um, that when you add and remove elements from arbitrary locations in the vector, all of the shifting and, and moving of the elements left and right, that causes those to be big O of n runtime. Okay, I put that in red, just not to say that these are bad operations or you shouldn't call them. That's not what I mean by that. Uh, what I mean is you should be aware that they have a slightly higher cost. And so if there's a way to write the same code that doesn't use these operations as much, you may want to use that. You just want to be aware of the cost that you're, that you're incurring here, right? Okay. Um, so just as a quick uh, way of gauging this stuff, here are some of the major categories of algorithm runtime. And I mean, these numbers are kind of hocus pocus, but like, just to give you an example of how long an algorithm might take if it has these different growth rates, um, pretty quickly, if you start getting up into these growth rates like n cubed, n to the fourth, whatever, it gets really, really bad for an algorithm that would have run almost instantly in a lower growth rate. And uh, in particular, there are some algorithms that like, they're proportional to two to the n, which sort of means if you add one more element of data to the vector, the runtime of the algorithm doubles, which, uh, you might say, I can't think of anything that would take as long as that, but, well, some of you will discover it in your programming, but uh, some of you will, well, we'll, we'll see later some algorithms that are in each of these different classes. Uh, I think most people can understand constant time versus linear time. 
we saw it, you know, you could have n squared or n cubed. n squared might be if you had a vector and you had to examine each pair of elements, sort of n times n uh, pairs or n squared over two pairs. This logarithmic class is sort of like used for problems that divide an input in half over and over, like when you're doing what's called a binary search, which we'll talk about later, where you sort of are constantly cutting half of the elements from consideration. And so that has to do with the logarithm of the input size. Anyway, these are all runtime run classes that you'll see at some point in various algorithms. Uh, okay, so I want to talk about, uh, there's another collection type called a linked list. And you might have seen this before in your previous programming. I'm not going to assume that you've seen it. I'm going to talk about it on a sort of very high level today. Later in this course, in a few weeks, I'm going to come back and we're going to implement some of these collections on the inside, but not today. Uh, there is a class in the Stanford Collection Library called Linked List. And the weird thing about a linked list is it doesn't do anything interesting that a vector won't do. It has exactly the same methods. It has the same syntax. You can create one. You have to import, I didn't put on the slide, you have to include a linked list.h, but you, you declare one with the same syntax of the type of the elements here. And then all those operations on the previous slides that I showed you for a vector, you also have those here. Add, insert, remove, to string, size, is empty. All of the same, it's exactly the same set of methods. So this is strange when you first encounter this. Why would the people who made this library include two things, two uh, kinds of collections that do exactly the same thing? It seems redundant. And you probably know that computer scientists hate three things above all else. Redundancy, inefficiency, and redundancy. <laughs> yes. So, and this violates two of those three things. So um, redundancy and redundancy, right? So we don't get why we would have that. Well, why this is here, in addition to the vector being here, is that they're built in very different ways on the inside. A vector is built using an array, which is a big brick of memory that you store each element into. A linked list is made up of these little boxes called nodes. Each box stores one element value inside. And the element, the nodes are then connected or linked together using a mechanism called pointers that I don't want to talk about very much today. But suffice it to say that you have little, I talk about like, um, you know, it's almost like little train cars, you know, where if you want to, if you have a big long train, you can sort of take the cars apart and rearrange them and put them back together and each little car stores some cargo. That's kind of like what a linked list is doing. So, okay, why is that different or better or worse than a vector? Well, you know, we're going to talk about it more later, but I think what I would say for now is that some of these operations are faster or slower on a linked list because of that different internal structure. So for example, if this is the linked list that you have and you say, I want to insert the value 42 at index 3, what the linked list does, rather than like shifting everybody over, it just tells this guy, hey, the, the next box after you is going to be a new box with a 42 in it. And the next box after that is the one with the 7 in it. And for various reasons, the computer doesn't have to like shift the memory over. It just works. And so that insertion has a different runtime for that reason. Now, of course, you know, when you have a proper linked list, you have to sort of look through the list to find the place to do this operation. So I mean, there's some pros and cons to this, but, but my point is just that building something in a different way internally might lead to a different big O or a different runtime of the same set of operations, which is interesting. Yeah? So you said that this might be faster because you don't have to shift things, but at the same time, you just mentioned that you have to iterate until you reach the element that you want to place in your element. Right, so right. So like N also? Well, so the question is, is this a different big O? Is it faster? Is it slower? Well, OK, I mean, I, I wanted to describe the general notion of how you add to a linked list. And I haven't really answered yet, is it actually faster or slower? If you measured it with a timer, which one would be faster? I think for a case like this, there are some pros and some cons of this versus a vector. But there are some cases where the linked list is clearly better than a vector. So for example, um, if you want to add something to the start of a linked list, that's really fast. You just make a new box, you point the new box at the old box, and you're done. And with a vector, you have to shift every single element over. With a linked list, you don't have to shift any elements over. So that front insertion operation, what is the big O of that for a linked list? It's big O of 1 or constant time, as opposed to being big O of n for a vector. Again, like, I'm not talking about this in a lot of detail. We will come back to this in a lot more detail. I wanted to sketch out the sort of general concept with you that <clears throat> two implementations internally of the same operations could have different big O. 
If you look at this chart, <laughs> oh sorry, it looks like my slide cuts off there, but if you look at this chart, it kind of looks like the linked list is worse, but these are average run times, and I think these asterisks, I want to emphasize that like if you're inserting at the front, the linked list is actually big O of one, even though the average is big O of n. So I'm not trying to say, look, the linked list is worse or better or whatever. I'm just saying if you were going to make a list of elements and you knew that you were going to be doing a whole bunch of insertions and removals at the front of the list, you might go out of your way to choose a linked list instead of a vector because it would be faster. So there you go. This idea that you have multiple ways to implement the same operations, we call this abstract data types or ADTs. The, the idea of an abstract data type is it's a set of operations you want, which is detached from how you implement that, bless you. So the ADT here might be called list. I want a list of data. And the specific implementation of the operations of a list might be a vector or might be a linked list. So the list ADT, the set ADT, the, the dictionary or map ADT, these are things that are more general uh, that could have multiple different implementations of them. Yeah? I was wondering, uh, why is it um, appending to the end of a linked list is over one? Oh, oh, why is it, uh, if you add to the very end of a linked list, why is that fast? Well, because most linked lists maintain uh, markers to get to the end, the two ends. And so if you add to the front, it could jump straight there quickly. And if you add to the end, you can jump straight there quickly. But if you want to walk to other places, you have to sort of walk along these links and find the middle. So the middle is usually the bad place. Yeah, but it depends how you implement it. Um, okay, so anyway, this is an interesting idea, this example of ADTs, and when we learn how to implement collections, we'll be thinking about this idea a lot. And in fact, most languages have multiple implementations of their ADTs. In Java, there's an ArrayList class, which you might have used if you came from 106A or a Java AP course or something like that. In addition to ArrayList, there's also another class called LinkedList. I don't know if you used it or not, but it's there. <clears throat> In Java, there's a thing called a hash map, which is like a dictionary of pairs. There's also a tree map, which is a slightly different dictionary of pairs. There's a hash set and a tree set. They often have two or three implementations of the same operations in Java and in many other languages. So this concept is pretty common in programming. So, okay, um, with that said, any questions about that real quick before I jump? I want to jump to another set of, uh, of slides here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So for the, the linked list, if I keep searching some element inside the, the list, then does the, the program go from the, the first one and the jump one by one by one? Mm. It, what does it have to do to search? Well, I mean, I think searching either of these two structures is sort of a linear traversal. If you want to search for an element in a vector, you have to loop over each int i looking at the element in each box. If you want to search through a linked list, it has to loop through by jumping along these links and looking at each box. So I think each one has sort of a linear runtime. And if you do multiple searches, uh, you could notice a slowdown with a linked list because it has to walk across the list many times to look for things. But yeah, they're both not ideal for searching, to be honest. Um, if you want to search for membership of an element, there's a better structure that we'll learn about this week. Or for example, if I wanted to add uh, each element by one. Then oh, increment each element. Yeah, yeah there's a way of looping that, over this with those for each loops by reference, yeah, where you could do be, plus plus. Would that be big O of n or big, big O of n squared? It would be big O of n if you used a for each loop. to Loop over each element by reference and plus plus the value or change the value, that would be fine. But That'd every time you will search from well, one one, no, a for, a for each loop uses a more efficient internal iteration um, structure for that. So you're right that if you use a list, a linked list in the wrong way, you can incur a high runtime cost. You have to be careful. Uh, we'll come back to it more. Frankly, I'm not going to make you use a linked list in the homework too this week. So I'm, I'm, that's why I'm de-emphasizing it in terms of how much time we're spending on it. I wanted to spend more time on vector because that's kind of the canonical indexed one dimensional structure that we want to use for most problems in this class. But this one is better for certain problems, particularly ones where most of the adding and removing is at the start. If it's at the end, a vector is fine for that. If it's in the middle, they're both kind of bad for that. So mostly if you're doing stuff at the front over and over and over, linked list is good for that. Anyway, um, okay, so that's a linked list. That's what an ADT is kind of briefly. We will be revisiting this idea a lot. So um, I think the two big themes from this lecture today are number one, what I said, previously, which is that there's usually more than one way to implement the same operations and that there might be pros and cons of each way. And then the second big idea today is that if you build a simple structure that doesn't have very many supported operations, it might be 
able to implement those operations better, more efficiently, more simply. And so that's why I want to talk to you about two structures called stacks and queues. This content comes from chapter five of the textbook, just like all these other collections. So um, stacks and queues, they are what I would call specialty collections. I think it's going to be a tough sell for me to convince you that these are cool, because everything they do, you can do with a vector. And a vector can do more. So these things are strictly worse than a vector. But I don't know what to tell you. It's like you have the ability to use these powerful vectors, and I'm trying to sell you something worse. But it's like if you guys have a chainsaw, and I'm trying to sell you a steak knife. You know, Sometimes I don't want a chainsaw, because I might cut my arm off with it or something. You know, I don't know. More power is not always better. Why do you have a bike if you have a car? Sometimes something that's less powerful is still useful for various reasons. Um, <clears throat> so a stack is a structure that stores elements in a given order, and you can add and remove elements from the top of that ordering only. So you can add things to the top, and they stack up, or you can remove things from the top, which means the last thing you've added will come out. That's all a stack does. <laughs> that's it. Um, there's also something called a queue, which is like a line of, of elements waiting. In fact, if you're from uh, if you're English, you would you would call a line of people waiting for a, a restaurant or something. You would call that a queue, right? So it's a line of elements that are added at the back of the line and removed from the front of the line. That's all a queue does. <laughs> so again, these are not very powerful structures. You could do all of that stuff with a vector, but maybe we still want to learn about these anyway. So let's figure out why. Um, let's do stacks first. So again, you stack things up. You add elements, and they are remembered in a certain order. You say the earliest added element is at the bottom, and the last added element is at the top. If you ask the stack to remove an element, the one that comes out is the one that's on the top, the one that you added last. So that's why they say that some people who talk about stacks say that it has a last in is the first one out ordering, or LIFO. Um, <clears throat> Now, one thing that you have to think about when you, when you use a stack is you don't talk much about indexes, like int i equals zero. We use those brackets and those indexes a lot with vectors and with grids, and so you guys get really used to indexes as the way to like reach into a collection to get things out. But with a stack, you don't really do it that way. You sort of have to let go of that idea. And the only way you access elements is by saying, hey, stack, please give me the top element. And the rest of the elements are not reachable for you. You can't get them. They're underneath. Just like a real stack, you go to the cafeteria and there's a stack of plates, you grab the top plate, right? You know, the top plate sometimes has goo on it, you don't want the top plate. But they're like, there's a big heavy stack, you can't reach in there and get the bottom plate out because they're all stacked up. So it's kind of like that. You can only reach the top one, right? Um, so let go of the notion of indexes. You only access this one. <clears throat> the core operations that a stack supports are adding something to the top, which we often call pushing onto the stack, removing an element from the top, which we call popping an element off the stack, and usually you support some operation to look at the element that's on top without removing it, which we call peeking at the stack. Okay. Why would you want this sort of a thing? Well, there are many problems in CS that sort of have a stack-like structure to them. <clears throat> when you build a compiler or a programming language, you're often managing data that is stack-like. For example, when function main calls function A, which calls function B, which calls function C, each of those functions stacks up a set of memory about the function and the arguments and the local variables. Call stack. Um, if you write a compiler and you evaluate expressions, you know, A equals B times C plus D, you often make a stack of expressions and arguments that you want to calculate. Um, <clears throat> stacks are really useful for matching kinds of tasks. In fact, if you take a theoretical course, you'll learn about uh, you know, models for computing that are stack-based that are kind of interesting, push down automata and things of this nature. Um, so for example, if you want to know whether a string is a palindrome, you can sort of push the letters onto a stack and then pop them off and see if they come out the same way. One interesting side effect of a stack is if you add five things to it, you know, one, two, three, four, five, if you remove them, they come out five, four, three, two, one. And so you end up seeing them in the opposite order that you put them in, which is useful. If any kind of reversal task, a stack is good for that. And so on. There's lots of algorithms. Uh, one of my favorite applications of a stack is you can use it to help you write a maze solver. You sort of stack up the places that you want to search, and you pop things off to search them, and it helps you keep track of an order of things to look at. Um, you can also use it to implement an undo feature, like if you're writing a word processor or a Photoshop program. You sort of save each action the user performs 
and you put them into some kind of collection. Let's say you put them into a stack, and then if the user clicks undo, they want to undo the most recent action, which is the one that's on the top of the stack. So a lot of these tasks have this kind of nature to them. A stack is a good structure when you're in a situation like that. Okay? That's kind of the idea of what a stack is. Um, any questions about, about that so far? Wow, this group had no questions. I'm stunned. Uh, oh, one, yes. <laughs> Oh, infix, uh, infix means like A plus B, where the operators are between the operands, which you might say, well, what else would it be? But there's some operations where you say like plus A, B, which means add A and B. Like if you have a bad calculator, you have to type it that way sometimes. Thanks, Hewlett Packard. Um, anyway, yeah, just com computing mathematical expressions, basically. Okay. Um, if you want to actually write code that uses a stack, we have a stack library in the Stanford Collection Library. We include stack.h. Here's pretty much all the functions that you get. There's a few others, but these are most of them. You can also print a stack to C out or to an output stream. Um, so you can peek, which means look at the top on the stack without removing it. You can pop, which means remove from the top of the stack. Or you can push a value onto the top of the stack. So when you want to declare a stack, you just give the type of data that you're going to store, and you push, 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 and then you, you push 42, negative 3, and 17. And if you pop things off, you'll get 17, negative 3, 42. Okay? It's a simple thing, so I'm not going to... Do stacks have to store the same type of data? Uh, yeah, you have to store one type of data, like int, onto a stack. Same as the other collections, yeah. Pretty simple thing, right? There's just not a lot of behavior here. You'll notice there's no indexes, there's no square brackets, there's no get element i. That stuff is missing. It's not there. You can't do it. It's just not what a stack is. It's not what it's for. Yeah. I have a question. So uh, let's say if, if you want to make a stack of, like, of objects, then is there a way to pass it reference? If you want to make a stack of objects, uh, yeah, but you have, to, you have to use pointers, basically, for, for that. And we'll, we'll do pointers in a few weeks. Yeah, if you, want to, if you want to make a stack of objects, you either just make a stack of objects, in which case they get copied onto it, or you make a stack of pointers where it doesn't copy them. We'll, we'll learn about it. Um, okay, so here's some stuff you can't do with stacks. This is me trying to sell you on how cool this is, right? Here's all the stuff you cannot do. Boy, I'm the un-Steve Jobs today, right? Or no, that's what he does, right? He just takes stuff away, right? He takes a headphone jack away. He takes all the function keys away at the top of the keyboard, right? So I am kind of Steve Jobsy. I took your vector, but now I've got the i vector eight, and it has no indexes anymore. <laughs> It's so streamlined now. It's so streamlined. <laughs> right, it's 9.99.99. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm not the biggest Apple fan, but that's another thing. Um, anyway, sorry. So uh, you cannot loop over a stack by index accessing element i. It just doesn't let you. It doesn't compile. It doesn't work. OK. And um, what you do instead is usually you write a loop that says, while the stack is not empty, I will pop an element from the stack and I will do something with it. In fact, I'm pretty sure that even the for each loop does not work here. So there's no way to just like loop over the elements. You have to do a loop that sort of pops things off and processes them. Of course, there is an interesting thing about this loop. If you run a loop that says, while the stack is not empty, pop an element and print it or whatever, at the end of the loop, What's the state of the stack? Empty. It's empty. So a funny thing about stacks is you can't process them without emptying them out. Um, you know, because like sometimes you want to loop over a vector or something, and then when you're done, you expect the vector contents to still be there. A stack makes you clear out the contents to process the contents. But again, if that isn't what you want, maybe you shouldn't be using a stack for this particular problem. Most of these kinds of problems, if you're going to access a stack or use a stack, this is what you want. So it works. Um, so, OK, I want to do a quick example with you guys. I want to write a function called check balance. Uh, this is, I want to look at a string that represents code, like C++ code. And what I want is I want to look for parentheses, and I want to look for curly braces. And I want to see if they are balanced in the string. So in other words, if you open a parenthesis right here, you eventually have to close the parenthesis like there. Or if you open a curly brace here, you have to close the curly brace there. But these things can be nested, right? You can have a curly with a parenthesis inside of it. And so not only do you have to close the things that you open, but you also have to have the right relative ordering. So like if I open these parentheses, 
and then I close a curly brace, that's out of order, do you understand? Like, if I open something, I have to close him before I close anybody outside of him, right? Okay, so this is the stack lecture. So how does a stack help me to solve this problem? Uh, what do you think? Yeah. Well, my first guess would be that every time you see an open parenthesis, you add the index to the stack. And then every time you see a closing parenthesis, you remove uh, one of the indexes. And then each time you try to remove, you first check to see if it's empty. So you know that if um, if there's like a, if you're trying to remove one too many, then it'll point back to the index that it, that it fails. At. Yeah, I, I think you have the right uh, seed of the algorithm here, where you said uh, when I see opening parentheses and curly braces, I'll push things onto the stack, and when I see closing things, I will pop off the stack and I'll, I'll sort of compare and see if I like what I see, see if things match up. You were mentioning that I could push indexes onto a stack. I think it's fine to just push the characters themselves. I don't very much care about the index. I mean, I do have to return indexes eventually, but I think I can do that in a different way. Basically, if I see these opening curlies and parentheses, I can push them. And if I see closing curlies, I can pop. I, I think that's kind of the core of the idea here. Um, if we don't find anything wrong with the string, we'll say that the imbalance is at index negative one. But if I see an imbalance or something that's wrong, I'll return the index at which that imbalance occurs. Like this, I see a closing curly, but it should have been a closing parenthesis. I'll return a 14 index for that. Okay? Um, so I was going to work on this problem in uh, Qt Creator. I, I guess I, I could do that, but I was going to have fun and, and go to the, um, the website, the step-by-step -step website, which has this exercise in here. So I can just type my code here. Um, so. What's the um, heading of the function? Check balance. What's the, um, what are the parameters here? It's a string of code or something? Right, right. And you say, if somebody says stack, well, I mean, I want to use a stack, but I think the heading of the function doesn't make me pass a stack. I want to use one inside here. Um, can you guys see that? Make that a little bigger. There. Um, OK. So now. What am I going to do here? Yeah, this thing already has the include of the, I would include stack.h. So it's already, it already knows about that, so I can just start writing this code. So um, do you want me to make a stack? We could store the parentheses, like a stack of cares called paren parentheses, semicolon. OK. Now what? Okay, loop over the characters of the string. Sure, uh, for each int i goes from zero to code dot length, i plus plus. Cool. Um, so now you you said if I see the um, braces, I could push onto the stack. So why don't I implement that right now? So if the code i is the parenthesis, or code i is the curly brace then I would do parentheses dot push code I. Push that character on the stack. OK. If it's a closing brace, yeah, so I think what you would have is like, so if you're following this algorithm, you'd push a parenthesis and a parenthesis, and then I would see a closing parenthesis. So the stack is going to have like these two things on it. And then I see this, so I need to make sure that this matches with what's on, on the top of the stack, right? So how about else if, if the thing is a closing um, uh, parenthesis or curly, so this or that, then... Um, you might want to have two well, so two well, three. You want me to do two? Okay, sure. Uh, else if like that, sure. Okay, so if it's a closing brace, what I I have a I have a stack of characters. I could say char top equals parens dot. How do you remove from the stack? Pop. Pop that's right. So the stack might be empty. Sorry, what's that? Do you want me to put those back together again? Yeah. Yeah. Don't do it. Okay, we'll write it and then we can decide. <laughs> I've got like 300 compilers here helping me. Um, so wait, like if if the character that's on top isn't an opening parenthesis, that's bad, right? Yeah. 
So that means I would return that the, there's a bad thing here. We return that this index is bad. That means index i is bad. Do you understand? Right. Okay, so then, uh, so you've got a kind of a similar piece of code here, which is if it's a closing this, I would say yeah, I want it to be like that. Yeah, but we're the opening one. Oh, sorry, the opening one. Sorry, uh, yeah. You need to have a return at the end as well. Okay. I think there's a couple things we still need to fix here, which I'm hearing lots of very helpful <laughs> cacophony of suggestions here all at once. Um, tell me a single thing you'd like me to address or fix in the back with glasses. Yeah. Uh, wait, is there, like, don't we need two stacks? Because what happens if you have, like, 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 two, like, a regular consist and then, like, two close of the other one? Like, isn't it just going to be like that's valid? Yeah, that's a great question. What about if there's too many closing parentheses relative to the number of opening parentheses? No, I meant, like, different kinds. Or too many different kinds? Yeah, I, I think it'll be okay as long as as long as the ones that come before are stacking up and then we're popping them off when we see the things that match up against them, I think we'll be okay. So I think this code will push, 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 and then as we see the closers for them, we'll pop, 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 and we'll compare each one. So I think as long as the code is valid, this will work, but there probably are some cases that it doesn't handle properly. Like what's one kind of case it might not handle right? It might get confused if you start if the stack's empty, like if there's nothing on the stack, like if I say open and then close, close, that second close, there won't be anything on the stack. If you try to pop out of an empty stack, it crashes your program with an exception. That's bad. So actually, I can leave it. I, you, know, I don't, you don't have to take my word for this stuff. Let me, let me fix that. That's a, you're right that that's a bug. Let me fix it in just a second. Um, before I fix it, if we get all the way, I actually tried to submit the code and it said my control has reached the end of my function. It means I didn't return something out at the very end. If I get to the, all the way to the end of the for loop, that means there's nothing wrong with the string. I should return a negative one if there's nothing wrong with the string. String is good. Okay. So I submit this and it says I got an exception trying to pop from an empty stack. And I believe that happened on this test which is where here these are balanced, but now I have a closer without an opener. So I think right there I have an empty. So that's what you were saying. So, okay, cool. Um, so what do you want me to do here? Like before I pop it, I could say if the parens is empty, then that's bad, right? So return I, that means there's nothing balanced for that. Boy, you guys were smart to split these two pieces of code up. Those are totally different. I'm just giving you a hard time. Uh, okay, so that's, so now I pass that case, I pass these three, but now this one fails. What's wrong with this case here? The stack isn't empty at the end. The stack isn't empty at the end. So, so like when I see this, it balances with that, but when I see this, there's no balance for him. And I believe the spec, I didn't leave the spec of the problem up on the screen very long, but I believe what we're supposed to do is, if you get to the end and there were some openers that were unclosed, I think we're supposed to return the length of the string as being the place where the error is. Okay? So now how do I incorporate that into this algorithm here? At the very end, yeah, when I get done with my for loop, if, uh, if the parens stack is empty, then that's good, so I'll return negative one. Else I'll return code string dot length. How about that? All right, we did it. So, uh, I used to have like Darth Vader sounds and stuff, but then I thought I might get sued for that. So I changed it to like obscure video game noises that, well, not obscure, but like I don't yeah. think they'll know. So <laughs> Nintendo never sues anyone, right? They're very non litigious as a company. Okay, anyway, never mind. Uh, cut that part out of the video. Um, <laughs> So we're good, we did it. I mean, look, the point of this problem, I, I would say we should probably have maybe tried to consolidate this a little bit, but that's okay. I'm gonna leave this. If you wanna go fix that, you can. I just wanted to play with stacks and do an example where we pushed and popped. And I, I guess my thesis here is that we totally could have used a vector. This would have been fine, but we didn't need any of the vectory things. And the stack was perfectly fine. And I think that the, the, the ideas of pushing things on and popping things off were kind of, intuitive for this problem. So there are problems like this where a stack will do just fine. You might still not be convinced because you say, look, a vector is great. I just want to get good at using a vector. I don't care about a stack. I guess what I would say is that the other thing about a stack 
is that since it only has to supply a few operations, that might mean that the people who implement the stack could build it in a very efficient way, a very lightweight way, doesn't use as much memory, maybe runs a little faster. In fact, I think I have a slide coming here where I talk about, um, wait, hang on, do I not have that? Wait, let me find this. Uh, where is it? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Do I not have the big O on here? Oh, I do, it's right there, okay. so. I didn't mention this, I didn't emphasize this when I showed these operations, but looky, looky, every single operation that the stack performs is a efficient big O of one constant time operation. So, I mean, if you don't provide as many operations, maybe you could make sure the ones that you do provide are implemented in a clever, efficient way. That's cool. So it's almost impossible to make the wrong call and have the stack take forever to finish doing the call. Do you know what I mean? So that's kind of neat. Um, okay, any other questions about the about the, the stack or the check balance or the source code that we wrote? Good. In the back, yeah? A vector could be used here as well, yes. And if we used it carefully in the right way, like if we always added and removed from the far end of the vector, it would be just about as efficient as this, yes. So it's definitely possible to use a vector in this place. So yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to say a stack's the only way to do this well. I'm just saying this thing almost forces you to do it in an efficient way because there's nothing else that it can do, <laughs> you know? It's a steak knife, not a chainsaw. Okay, um, if you really want to know how a stack is implemented on the inside, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it's usually implemented using a vector or an array. When you want to add things to the stack, the bottom is the zero index and the top is the, the highest index. Why do you think we store them in that order and not the opposite? Yes? Because the remove operation needs to be caught some time, and we don't want to move things when we remove. Yeah, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm popping from here, I'm going to have to like slide these guys over. That is no good. I want to push and pop. The place where you're doing all the adding and the removing is the top. So that should be the end of the array, because that's where it's efficient to add and remove from an array. Yes. You can use a linked list, but uh, more common to use an array. Uh, question? Yeah? Um, with regard to capacity, uh, so we, we talked about it last, week, <coughs> last class. Is it basically automatically allocated in this case, or is there a kind of Oh, right, like does this run out of space, does it resize? It's kind of like a vector in the sense that it probably has some array with some extra space and when it runs out of space it will automatically grow itself and you as a user of it don't need to worry about it. If you were going to implement your own stack from scratch, if there was no such thing as a stack and you wanted to build one, you would have to think about that problem, that issue. Yeah. So, so, so then a, a wide scope of Oh, why is it big O of one to insert? Yeah. Uh, we call it an amortized runtime, where almost all of the ads are big O of one, and then occasionally there's one that <laughs> isn't. But if you can take his cost and spread it across the others, if you think about it, you have sort of n ads that are fast and an n plus first ad that's slow. So if you take his cost and spread it, it's almost like all the others have a cost of two instead of one, which is still a constant amount of amortized runtime. So we, we, uh, we say that overall the adding is constant. Although, yes, in the worst case, it might have to resize. OK, um, so with that said, let's talk about queues, another structure that doesn't do very much, but does it in an efficient way. Uh, a queue is kind of like a waiting list of people or something like that. Uh, you add things to the back, the back of the list, and you remove things from the front of the list. And we, so we say the first person that comes in is the first person that comes out. This is like a... Uh, uh, no cheating, no cuts kind of a line where you can't get into the middle of the line. Um, I'm that guy who like goes and gets after people because they cut in front of the line or whatever and then they go, this is my wife. And I'm like, sorry, you and your wife should go to the back, mister. I'm that guy. But uh, the queue is the collection version of me. It does not allow anybody to cut into the middle. Um, it does store the elements in a given order. Like it knows who was inserted first and who was inserted last. So they have an order, but we don't really think of them as having bracket indexes like 0, 1, 2. You only add to the back, you only remove from the front. The three core operations of queue supports are called in queuing, sometimes you just call it adding, dequeuing, which you could also call removing, and peaking. Dequeuing and peaking come from this, this front element here, right? Why would you want to queue? There's lots of examples in computer science. Um, if you have a printer and different computers can all print to the same printer and the printer takes a minute to get the pages to come out, you have to have like a list of jobs, print jobs that are gonna come out and what order are they gonna come out. 
And so a print job queue is like a classic place where you might use this type of collection. Um, there's all kinds of things, like you have a network connection, like a BitTorrent or a download or something, and it has to send or receive a collection of packets, and it has to do it in a certain order, so it queues them up, but then it sends them out of the queue when the connection is ready. Um, there's all kinds of examples in programming of um, things you want to line up and then do in order. In fact, a lot of the cases where you use a vector, you could just use a queue, depending on what you're doing exactly. So yeah, there we go real world examples and stuff. Uh, if you want to use a queue in your C++ code, you can include the library queue.h. And these are the main operations that it supports. Just like with the stack, they're all big O of one. They're all efficient. You can add to the back. You can remove from the front. You can peek at the front. You can ask if it's empty or how many elements are in it. So here's a quick example. I queue up three elements. The 42 is in queued first. So when I dequeue, the 42 comes out first. Yeah. How is the DQ uh, O of 1? If you have to remove from the front, then you have to shift the entire thing over? Yeah, uh, good question. If How is it that the DQing is big O of 1? Your question, I think, assumes that it's an array implementation because it would shift. But the answer is that this is often not implemented using an array. I think I have a slide on this. I think I, I jumped slide ahead. But uh, you usually implement a queue as a linked list, where if this is the front and I want to DQ him, I just grab him. It's, it's constant for me to grab him out of there, and then I just delete this, and now I make him be the front. And if you want to end queue, usually you have a way to get to the end very quickly and a way to get to the front very quickly. You can implement a queue using an array. You use something called a circular array, where you keep track of, instead of just a zero to size type of thing, when you dequeue, you think of the front as moving forward to index one or two. That way you don't have to shift. You just you think of the queue as starting at index one or two or three, but then it gets confusing because you get to the end and you like wrap around and you know time vortexes open up and stuff like that. So um, anyway, but the good news is that it uh, it doesn't usually have any efficiency problems. It usually really is implementing all these operations in constant time. Right, and so actually a vector if you wanted to do this same kind of stuff, it would be somewhat harder to make sure that you did it efficiently. You would often, if you were adding to the end of a vector and removing from the front of a vector, those front removals would tend to be big O of n unless you were being clever. And so uh, you know, this does sometimes get you a more efficient outcome than a vector would get. OK. Uh, any other questions just so far now that just I'm showing you the basic syntax of the queue? OK, well, just like with a stack, you don't do a for loop from 0 to size, usually. You uh, don't do a for each loop, usually. You have one of these chomping loops that, while the queue isn't empty, you dequeue an element and do something to it. Pull an element off. If it's a print job, then print that, that document. Or pull off a packet. If that's a network packet, send it over the network, whatever. Uh, it is possible to loop over a queue kind of like what a for each loop would do, but you have to kind of hack it a little bit. What you do is, if the size of the queue is 10, you loop 10 times. And what you do is you dequeue the front, you look at it, and then you enqueue it again at the back of the line. <laughs> so if everybody gets off the line and gets back on the back of the line, and everybody does that exactly n times, then when you're done with that, if you just think about it for a second, you have the same line of people that you started with. So you can look at the contents of a queue without losing them in that way. What if you wanted to do that with a stack? You understand you sort of pull one out, look at it, and put it back? If you have a stack of 10 things <laughs> and you do that 10 times, what happens? You understand like you pull the top one off and print it 10 times and you never look at the nine elements under him. So that's a slightly different uh, uh, issue there. In fact, if you want to print the elements of a stack, without losing them, how do you think you should do that? Just, just conceptually speaking. Yeah, in the back, what would you do? Um, you could, no wait, I, I probably have to store them in a separate like, vector or a separate. Like, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, maybe save a copy, back them up somewhere, take them out, print them. I can't put them right back on the same stack. I could put them some other place. Maybe make another stack and put them in the other stack, and then they would stack up in the other place. And then when I'm done printing the first stack, I take them out of the second stack and put them back in the first stack. Or Yeah, something like that. You have to save them to a backup or something. That's right. And actually, if you think about it for a minute, like remember how things come out in the opposite order. You add 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They come out 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. 
So if you take those out and push them into another stack, they sort of go in upside down into that other stack with the five down here and the one up here. But then if you pull those back out, they flip back to the original when you put them back into the original. So you sort of reverse them twice. Do you get what I'm saying? So like you said, put them into an auxiliary vector, auxiliary stack, something like that. If you put them in a vector and then put them back, you would have to be careful not to flip the order backwards or something. Yeah. Anyway, so there are some cute loops for processing queues. The most common is this while not empty loop, but you might do this one if you want to keep the contents for some reason. Okay, you often use stacks and queues together. They're like best friends. And so you maybe make a queue and then you say, oh, I want to reverse the order of the elements of the queue. So you make a stack and while the queue is not empty, you dequeue things and push them into a stack. So now the queue is empty, but the stack has one, two, three with three on the top. And now while the stack's not empty, you pop that and put that back in the queue. And so basically that puts everything back into the queue, but it's in the reverse order at the end. That's a cute little, little trick there, right? Okay. So let's try to write some code, huh? Um, <clears throat> I think I want to do this one here called mirror. So give me a queue of strings. And then you change the state of that queue so that when you're done, it stores the original elements in the original order, but then it also stores those same elements in the opposite order after them. Does that make sense? What is the point of this queue? Is it A or B? Oh, yeah, sorry. I guess my, my writing is a little bit ambiguous. The front is the left and the back is the right. Think we can do this one? We're X. We can do anything, right? Um, <laughs> where is it? Uh, Mirror, there, here. Okay, help me do the heading. Mirror, and I ask for a queue of strings called Q. I think I, they happen to be one letter, but I think there's double quotes, so I think there's strings. What does it return? Void, because it modifies the queue you send it. That means something else is wrong, right? It has to be a reference. Yeah, okay, cool, good. Okay, how do I do it? Make a stack. Make a stack? Okay. Stack of string stack. So now what am I doing? If I, if I empty the queue into the stack and then put it back into the queue again, I will have reversed the elements. So that would change me from CBA, ABC to CBA. But I want both. Oh, cool. Okay, so I could do both. I could sort of pull them out and simultaneously stack them and also re-add them, like something like that? Okay, so how about like while the queue is empty? No. <laughs> well, yeah, you're on to me, huh? So how about like string s equals q dot dq? Um, I, when I used to learn queues, I couldn't remember how many, how many of these <laughs> dq. Or like a lot of people will write like that, like D, I'm gonna dick out of my queue. No, 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 anyway, whatever. Um, <laughs> Stack.push s, and then also put it back into the queue as well. Q dot in queue string. The, what's the problem with this code? <laughs> yeah, I think this is the right idea, but this will only work if the queue gets empty eventually, right? But I'm removing one and I'm adding one, and I didn't make it in half, but I'm pretty sure that means it stays the same size each time we go through that loop. So it actually, it'll never become empty. So that's probably not quite the right loop. You have a different suggestion, yeah. Oh, you could just uh, figure out what the size is and only loop that middle time. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. So maybe something like uh, int size equals q dot size, and then for int i equals zero, i is less than size i plus plus, or four, not while. Something like that. Okay, then we submit it and. Uh, uh, <laughs> You guys and my wife would get along great. You're both backseat drivers. <laughs> Delete that part from the video. Um, OK, fine, smart people. What did I forget? What's the problem? You have to add a reduce stack on the queue. Yeah, yeah. So what I have at the end of this code is the queue is back to its original state, and I also have the same elements in a stack. I need to take the ones out of the stack and put them on the end of the queue, right? So what? While the stack is empty, I don't have to use the for loop to size here. I can actually empty out the stack, right? So <laughs> q.nqs.pop, right? Maybe? Oh, that's funny. <laughs> what the heck is that? Wow. Euro symbol not declared. Well, uh, I think it's stacked up, huh? 
All right, we did it. We're so smart. Aren't we proud of ourselves? Yeah. <laughs> Only $999.99. The C++ Q structure, everybody. That's not how he talks, sorry. Um, I, can't, I can't do his accent. Anyway. Um, I think that's the main thing I wanted to say. Uh, I'm basically out of time. The only thing I want to mention is there is a structure called a deck, which is a double-ended queue that lets you add and remove from the front and the back efficiently. It kind of combines the best of both stacks and queues. It's usually implemented using a linked list. We don't use it as often, but it's there. All three of these are in our library. There's a deck. Dot H um, as well. So uh, those are stacks and cues. I'm going to stop there. Please check your section time. Make sure to go to your section. Have a great day. Don't forget homework one. I'll see you on Friday. Thanks. So, uh,